What a great, it's a great day at Calvary. <laughs> Thank you guys. Appreciate the encouragement. All right. Hey, we're glad that you're here this morning, and, uh, I, and I'm excited about today, not just because we've got Christmas decorations up, but I'm excited because you're here, and we're going to worship the Lord together. Amen? Amen? Look, this is, our nation is in the midst of contentious times. People are often deeply offended, even, including many Christians, by what they view as an antagonistic challenge to their expectations of government, of liberties and rights. I, I don't think in my lifetime I've never seen such dramatically opposing forces, ideologies, viewpoints. But, and, and people are angry. They're angry and they're outraged on both sides of the, of the political aisle. And, and the, look, is it a statement to say that there's a battle for the heart of America going on? I, I don't think that's an overstatement, friends, but the problems are not only political, they're not only cultural, they're not just value-driven. The problems, I, I believe the problems stem from a contentious and polarizing spirit, okay, that, that's behind the scenes, fanning the flames of dis and unrest. There's no doubt that this spirit is the ancient enemy of all that is godly and good. And his goals have not changed. Jesus called him, what? The thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the events of our day, in the events of our day, should move, friends, with that knowledge, that should move Christians to loving action. What's happening in our world is not, this is not the time for us to close the gates and bar the doors. We can't be passive bystanders watching the world burn. The church has got to stand together. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we stand together against the common enemy. And that's not one another. That's not Republicans and Democrats. Okay? The common enemy is the thief. The common enemy is Satan. So it may seem that we have more reasons to be apart than to be together. This is where unity should begin. Right here is where unity should begin. The people of God have got to work for unity. You realize that? Jesus prayed that we would be one, but you've got to work to, make, to be one. How many of you that are married have found that to be true? Okay? And to maintain that unity or that oneness, you've got to guard it. You've got to vigilantly guard it. So we need to be, I, I got to thinking this week that we need to be like the workers who were re rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem in Nehemiah's day. Under his leadership, they were rebuilding all the walls around Jerusalem. Here's what they did. They stood in the gaps of the wall, repairing them. They stood in the gaps, repairing them, but they stood in the gaps, and as they repaired, because there was an enemy that was trying to undo what God was doing, because there was an enemy, listen to this, they strapped on their side a sword, and within easy reach, they had a spear and a shield. So they stood in the gap, rebuilding, but also ready to defend against the enemy. So how do we do that? We don't do it by, by angry tweets. We don't do it with, uh, with loud proclamations on, on social media. We do it by praying. So would you join me right now in praying for our country? Come on, Ed, we know this election is important. Everybody knows that. That's why, the, that's why you can't get away from the political ads right now. From both sides, right? Everybody knows how important this is. But this, listen, America does not live in a bubble. What happens in America affects the world. Do you realize that? And that's why we need to pray. We're not, and, and look, look, regardless of, how, of who you vote for, can we stand together with this truth binding us? God, I want your will. I want your will. Thank you for the privilege of growing up in America. Are you with me? Everyone. 
Doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat, everyone. Thank you for the privilege of growing up in a democratic society. And God, we don't want our will. We want your will. Not my will be done. I cast a vote. But ultimately, friends, even as I, even as I split it into, the, into the, uh, the, the vote, even when I did that, listen, not my will, but yours be done. Will you pray with me that way right now? Come on. Come on. The election is in two days. All right? It's going to take weeks to figure it all out, I'm sure. Okay? But God's already got it figured out. Amen? So come on, let's agree together right now. Let's pray. Let's pray for what's happening in our country. God, God we know that the polarizing spirit, the, the spirit that is trying to bring division, that the spirit that we talked about last Sunday that brings confusion... We know who that is. It's the thief. And the thief's mission, Jesus, you said it, he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So God, we stand together. We stand together first with thanksgiving in our hearts because we are so glad that we are we live in, in this country. What a privilege it is. It may not feel that way at times, but God, we know. Oh, I've traveled to other countries, so I understand, God, what a privilege it is to live here. In relative safety, God to live in in privilege, and and God, even though there's inequality, even though there's things that that have to change, we know that God. But here's what we we also know, God, that that you've placed us here to stand in the gap. This is our time, God. Sword on our hip, shield and and spear nearby we're going to stand in the gap and we pray for our country today god we pray for what's going to happen not just in the next two days but what's going to happen in the next two weeks the next two months the next two years god we we want your will to be done we stand in agreement god we agree together in this look not not our will we want your will because your will is what's best for us your will is what's best for, for America. Your will is what's best for this world. So God, let your will be done. We agree and we ask all this. We, we pray, God, that you would bind the enemy. Bind the enemy. <laughs> Lord, we, we, we see his schemes. We're not fooled. So we ask that you bind them, and we pray that, that you would loose a spirit of freedom, a spirit of joy, a spirit of celebration, not because of politics, but because of the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Let it begin right here, right here with us, with your church, we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. So look, we're not going to give in to despair or fear because our hope, do you remember this from last week? Our hope is not in a political system. It's not in a politician. Our hope is in the Lord. And he's the one that holds our tomorrows. Amen? So um, this is our last part. If you saw my little Facebook video this morning, you know this is the last part of Better Together. And uh, I'm excited about about ending this series because I'm, a, I'm also excited about what's next. Uh, but I, I, I do want to, I, that's, that's just a little teaser to get you to try to come back to church because what's he going to do next? What's going to happen? Now? Okay. Okay. It's not, I know you're not quite that excited. Uh, that's overstatement. But, uh, but anyway, I, I'm, I, I want to also express our appreciation to the folks that uh, did all the decorating and, and helped set up. Would you express your appreciation to them, please? I, I know it's early. I know some of you have some really strongly held beliefs about that, but too bad you're not in charge. I am. Okay, so um, I, I I like Christmas, and I I think I think uh, it's okay to decorate uh, a little early, and this takes a lot of pressure off of us as we go into the month. I promise you, it does. And so, thank you, all of you that were involved in this. I want to say how much I appreciate your involvement and your work to make this happen. We had uh, we had several different teams that were doing different parts. So, uh, thank you guys for for doing this seriously. So uh, we're in Romans chapter 12, so you'll want to open there. When Paul wrote to the believers in Rome, they were under attack. They had been marginalized for their beliefs. 
Their good news was not welcome in the halls of power and authority. So persecution was a common occurrence for the believers in Rome. In fact, under Emperor Claudius, Emperor Claudius, their citizenship was revoked, their property was seized, and they were expelled from Rome. Christians were kicked out of Rome. Later, under the infamous Nero, how many of you have heard of Emperor Nero? Okay, Christians were falsely accused of setting the great fire of Rome in AD 64. And in the persecution that followed, in retribution, Christians were burned alive. Look, it was under Nero's rule that Peter and Paul were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. So look, when Paul writes to the Christians in Rome, he knew exactly what kind of persecution they were enduring. So in response, Paul encourages them, and we read about that right here in Romans chapter 12, and and pick it up with me in verse 14. He says, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. (laughs) I'm just going to take a breath right there. Okay? Do all that you can do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, and this is God speaking, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And in doing this, you'll keep burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you but conquer evil by doing good. So I, I, I wanted to, this is, uh, we've, we've been doing a verse or two at a time, and now we're going to do a, eight verses in one Sunday. How, how many of you are ready to camp out here for a while? Okay. It might be one of those kind of sermons, you know, that just, you know, don't worry. It doesn't, there's not eight points to this message. There's only three, and here they are. Here's the first one. In Paul's instruction to, Rome, to, to Christians in Rome who were being persecuted, His first part of his instruction is to show grace, to share grace, to share grace. Go back to verse 14. He says, bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. I like this. I I like this instruction because at first he says, bless those who persecute you. And then it's almost as if he, he realizes how hard that is. And he says, so pray that God will bless them. You get it? Can you imagine after, after all that they've endured, after all the persecution the believers in Rome have endured, he gives them that kind of instruction. Look, we might be tempted to water this down in some way that makes us feel better. Kind of like a, kind of like a backhanded southern way of showing grace. I grew up in the South, and there's all kinds of Southern sayings and things that, that just remind me of this. I, I, and, and growing up in, in the Deep South, in, in South Louisiana, I, I, I understand that some things are lost in translation. Some people, if you're, you're from the North, and I know people think that this is the South. Trust me, this is not the South. Kentucky is not the South. All right? But there are some phrases that we use here that we used also in Louisiana, and, and people that are from the far north, Yankees, they, they may not know exactly what, what um, just a real quick story. My, first, time, first time my grandmother uh, met my wife, he says, uh, we were at a Thanksgiving meal, and she said, she said to me, my wife is sitting right there, and she said, Jeff, do you think your little, your little Yankee would like some uh, gravy on her? I'm not lying. Do you think your little Yankee would like some gravy on her potatoes? Seriously. <laughs> it was kind of a graceless Thanksgiving, I promise. But here's some of the phrases. Here's some of the phrases. It's catty corner to that place over yonder. 
All right, we're actually going to capture two words here. First of all, catty corner means diagonal to something, like buildings that are kind of across the street at an angle from one another, okay? And yonder is an indeterminate distance somewhere between here and there. Catty corner, though, is not to be confused with cattywampus. It's all cattywampus. That's 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 my that's that, that's my uh, word for everything that's going on in in the United States right now. It's all cattywampus. That just means that just means it's crooked or sideways. <laughs> or if you go to if you go to dinner or lunch with someone uh, from from especially from Louisiana, this is what we would say when we ordered our drink. I'd like a Coke. But that doesn't necessarily mean a Coca-Cola. It could mean any carbonated beverage. Okay? So, and, and, and it, I want to get into a few phrases that are some of my favorites, like this one. Now, now don't, don't be ugly. That has nothing to do with physical appearance. It means don't be mean or don't misbehave. Okay? Don't be ugly. All right? But here's my two favorite Southern sayings. Aren't you precious? Now, that is almost always said sarcastically with a, with a smile and a really slow blink of the eyes. And it's usually in, re in response to someone that is being offensive or is being offended. Okay? And the real meaning of it is, aren't you a special kind of stupid I'm just telling you the truth, okay? A variation on that theme is this next phrase. Bless your heart. That sounds like an empathetic phrase spoken to someone who, who, who is considered sweet or misguided or dumb, okay? But what it really means is, sweetie, you need to grow up. And you need to deal with it. Okay? That's, I, and those are... The, Southern phrases, but when Paul tells the believers in Rome to bless their persecutors, he's not, he's not saying, hey, do it in a southernly, snideful, be polite, smile, say one thing, but really mean another kind of way, because that's just ugly. That's not the kind of blessing that he wants us to, to pronounce on those who persecute us, or those who take advantage of us. Look, we share grace by showing grace. Bless them. Don't curse them. Bless them. Don't curse them. Pray for God to bless them. So grace isn't reserved just for the people that we think deserve it. Right? In fact, the very concept of grace is that it's for people who least deserve it. That's why it's grace. And with that kind of generous grace in mind, you may remember a conversation, a question that Peter asked Jesus. It, it, Matthew records it in his gospel, in Matthew 18, and it, in just two verses here, starting with verse 21, and that's the question. Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Okay. Okay. It's really kind of two questions, but it, it's, you know, how, how many times should I forgive someone that sins against me, that hurts me, that takes advantage of me, that persecutes me? How many times? Seven times? Verse 22 has Jesus' response, and you know it. No. Jesus says, no, Peter. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. Right? 70 times, say that with me. 70 times times seven. I like the way one commentator uh, describes this encounter between Peter and Jesus. Peter was wishing to appear especially forgiving and benevolent when he asked Jesus if forgiveness was to be offered seven times. And the reason for that is because in that day, Jewish rabbis taught that forgiving someone more than three times was unnecessary. And they actually cited scripture going all the way back to the minor prophet Amos. And in Amos chapter 1, you can read this, verses 3 through 13, God forgave Israel's enemies three times, and then he punished them. So that became the rule. 
You can forgive someone three times, and after that, it's not necessary to forgive them. But by offering forgiveness more than double of what the Old Testament called for, Peter, maybe he's expecting some kind of special commendation from God. Because if the rabbis are teaching three, he says seven, so he's like, seven times, right? Seven, right? Jesus' answer must have stunned the disciples. Because they knew that he wasn't limiting forgiveness or grace to 490 times. The terms of the law established a limit to forgiveness. But Jesus is teaching that grace has no limit. So with that in mind, friends, share grace with the same measure that you want to receive it. So the picture I had in my mind, the picture I had in my mind is, uh, how much grace do you need? How much, just, just think, okay? How much grace do you need? Maybe you need this much grace. Maybe you need a shovel full of grace. Okay? A lot of grace, in other words. But what if there's someone in your, your life that also needs grace, and you're, you're the one to show them grace? How much grace are you going to show them? Oh, this, by the way, is a quarter of a teaspoon. Share grace with the same measure that you want it, that you need it. So you can share, see, see, this is the problem with a lot of Christians. They need this much grace, but they only share this much grace. You want me to say it again? Sweetie? You're out there somewhere. You might be watching this on, on live stream. Love you. How much grace do you need? How much are you going to share? Right, one more time. How much grace do you need? How much are you going to share? So some of you are out there going, because uh, you've got a dump truck up on the platform. then that's the amount that you need to share. Does that make sense? You don't think that's a biblical concept. You haven't read the Gospels. You haven't read what Jesus taught about grace and forgiveness. You haven't read how Jesus showed this, how he modeled this principle of grace and forgiveness. Share grace. Here's the second piece of instruction. Love well. Love well. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. How's that for a mouthful? That's a sermon right there, right? We could just camp out on that, on those two verses alone. But here's the thing. I'm, I'm just going to ask you two questions. Here's the first one. Why can't we be happy with those who are happy? Why can't we be happy with those who are happy? Two reasons. Envy and jealousy. They're related. They're like brothers and sisters. Envy and jealousy. We can't celebrate someone's success or their good fortune if we're jealous of them. The sneaky thing about envy and jealousy, though, is that, is that they can be passive. In other words, you may not even be consciously aware that, that they've taken up residence in your heart until someone else succeeds in a way that you wanted to succeed. Envy and jealousy will always create disharmony and they will always fracture relationships. They're the enemies of unity. So remember the orchestra analogy that we used a few weeks ago? Okay. So here's the second question. What prevents us from weeping with those who weep? In a nutshell, a hard heart. A hard heart. A lack of empathy, though. What hardens our heart? It's not just a lack of empathy. That's, that's a symptom. What hardens our hearts, friend, is selfishness. In our selfish preoccupation, we don't, we're not even aware of other people's needs. 
in our in our small worlds that that only involve our sadness or our situations or our our suffering we don't have time for other people's suffering we don't have time for other people's what what they're going through can't you see i'm going through something much worse than you are selfish it, listen it could even be born out of a harsh a harsh spirit they deserve that they deserve that and, and now i tongue in cheek i've said this before to some of you okay i've said this phrase sometimes you get grace and sometimes you get what you deserve right how many of you heard me say that don't don't answer that question <laughs> i've probably said it from the pulpit but it's tongue in cheek friends because the, the truth is, yes, there are consequences for when we do wrong. There are consequences for, for our sin. But, but let me tell you something. Let, let, hear me out on this, okay? The idea that people deserve what they're going through is harsh. Because no, you, you wouldn't want anybody wishing that on you. Am I right? Uh, let me get my props here again. How much grace do you need? How much are you willing to pass out? You wouldn't wish that on someone else. But in a harsh spirit, we say, well, they, de they deserve that. Out of our selfishness, they deserve that. Uh, last week I read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3, and this is what it said, because some of you were tuned out by that time of the message, but here's what it says. Remember those in prison. <laughs> remember those in prison they deserve to be in prison they were there because they you know you do the crime you do the okay you know that one so they deserve it except that in this case it's christians who are being persecuted and thrown into prison for their faith in context so he says the writer of hebrews says remember those who who are in prison as if you were there yourself. He, he goes on to say, remember those who are being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your body. Look, what creates disharmony? Paul identifies it right here in this passage in Romans chapter 12. The two things that create disharmony, pride and arrogance. Don't be pr too proud to hang out with ordinary people and don't arrogantly think you know it all right pride and arrogance they're the chief culprits and the instigators of disharmony in fact if you go to the yeah, we've referenced this through this series um the other passage that talks about the gifts remember in in first corinthians chapter 12 he also talks about the body and the, and he uses this silly analogy paul uses the silly analogy of of parts of the body refusing to connect because they're not the part that they want to be Am I right? That's, that's exactly what's going on there. So what happens, let me ask you this, what happens to the testimony of the church when we don't love well? What, what's the testimony of the church when disharmony rules? <coughs> well, I'll tell you three things. Jesus is misrepresented. Jesus is misrepresented. Faith is dismissed as irrelevant. And the devil wins. The thief wins. I needed the message that one of my friends texted me some time ago. She got it from a devotional. And, uh, and this is what she wrote to me in a long text. She said, she says, Pastor Jeff, we must call out greatness in each other. We must draw out, call out greatness in each other. If you see a brother struggling... Our brother or sister struggling, she wrote, if you see a brother or sister struggling with temptation, fight for them through prayer. Speak life into them. Encourage them. She wrote, encourage them in who God made them to be. And, and, and open up about your own struggles and ask for help, for, for their help for your own life. You don't have to, she wrote, you don't have to fight spiritual battles alone. 
There are people around you who will fight for victory in your life. Through Christ, she said, love has won. He, he's paved the way of victory for you and for me. We, are no, we, we no longer belong to this world. And she quoted Ephesians 2.10, which I shared last week. For we are God's masterpiece. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God had prepared for us beforehand, that we should walk in them. She wrote, Walk in the works that God intends for you to do today. And in love, fight for those around you to do the same. You and I are meant for more in this life than the struggle with sin. Let's fight for the victory in each other. She closed with this. I prayed for victory in your life. And, and for the Holy Spirit to, to give you power for you to love well with a clear conscience and the freedom in Christ that glorifies God in everything you do. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, for your prayers for me and my family. I needed to hear that. On that particular day, I needed to hear it, and I needed to get over myself, because I needed to get over myself, because we need to move past petty selfishness, petty differences and so that we can love well so that we can love well so at the end of that analogy that Paul uses about the body in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 this is what it says at the very end of it verse 25 and 26 it says this it says this makes for harmony among believers so that all the members care for each other. If one suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one is honored, then all the parts are glad. So friends, let's represent Jesus. And let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us to love well. Share grace, love well. Here's the last one. Seek peace. Seek peace. Let's pick it up at verse 17 there in Romans chapter 12. Verse 17, this is what it says. It says, never pay back evil with more evil. To think, do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. And dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I'll take revenge and I'll pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, Paul writes, if your enemy is hungry, if your enemy is if your enemy, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If, they're thir if your enemy is thirsty, give them something to drink. And in doing this, you'll heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Burning coals of shame. Yes! <laughs> yes, that's what I was looking for in this passage. Burning coals of shame. <laughs> so doing good is like the best revenge, right? Right? Not so fast. Not so. Do you really think that's what Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Do you really think that's the motivating factor for doing good? Shame on you. That is not why he wrote those words. How many of you remember playing tag? 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 Okay. How many of you were actually being able to run? I mean, I remember? Okay, good. Okay. I know who I'm talking to. So <laughs> you would you tag somebody, you tap them, and then what would you cry out? No tap backs, right? Right? No tag backs. And, and and listen, when I played with my brother, there was no tap if you were playing with him. Because his version of tag was called slug. His strategy when he when he tapped you was to disable you physically. To the degree that you were unable to move afterwards. So he would, he would slug you, okay? So the immediate reaction, our immediate reaction is always to strike back. Isn't it? Isn't that what the flesh wants to do? Somebody pokes you, you want to poke them right back. Somebody, somebody says something to you that's mean or hurtful, you want to say something mean or hurtful right back. Am I right here? I know I'm right. I know you people. I've been with you for a long time. Almost two decades. I know you. 
You know, this is, I, I know some of you are going, you haven't known me that long. I, it didn't take long to know you, okay? Trust me, okay? Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. <laughs> Of course we want to do. So, so the flesh always wants to retaliate. The flesh always wants to get back. Someone writes something on social media, you want to always get back at them, right? Somebody does something stupid. Some, I'm sorry. Some sweetie says something, you know, and, and you want to, you do. You just want to get them right back. You want to set the record straight. But this is what he says. Paul says, seek peace. And seeking peace means refusing to react. Because a reaction is chemical. Without thought, no filter, in your face, knee jerk. A knee jerk come, jack, come back with no consideration of the long term effects. We tend to regret reactions later on. My brother and I, um, we were like, I've described this before, we were like Cain and Abel at times, and I'll, I'll never forget one day, I've shared this before years ago, but um, we were, we lived at the end of a one-mile cul-de-sac, out, kind of out in the country, sort of, and uh, behind our house, it was hundreds of acres, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of acres of cow pastures, and we went, and we ran those like Indians, playing uh, out in there, and we had a great time Growing up, it's a great place to, to grow up. There was a few houses nearby, but, um, but my brother and I one day were playing in a in a field near our house. And my brother um, knew how to push my buttons. He's three years older than me, and he still knows how to push my buttons. Some of you know him, uh, and you know that he's uh, that's his spiritual gift. Button pushing is his gift, and especially with me. I mean, he just uh, he would just always seem to get the better of me. He was bigger, older. And the only advantage that I had over him was that I could see better than he could because he was legally blind. Well, one day we were playing, and I don't know what he said. I have no idea what he said or what really he even did. I just know my reaction. He did something that made me so mad, and then he laughed, and he turned around. That was a bad move. Because I, re I, I noticed on the ground there some logs. And I picked, picked up a log that was about four inches in diameter. And it was a little rotten. But I picked it up and I clobbered him in the back of the head. With, I was the baseball player. And I, I, I swung for the fences. And I clobbered him. And that, that log just exploded against his head. It was glorious. I watched him fall down and, and grabbed the back of his head and I was like, yes! Revenge is sweet! I'm so hot. Yes! I got the better of him! Well, his back was turned, but it didn't matter. I got the best of him! Yes! And then I heard him say, as he's laying on the ground, I'm gonna kill you! And I realized that I'd made a mistake. A tactical error, if you will. So I did the best thing, which was to run screaming back to our yard, crying out to the only person that I knew that could save me, which was not Jesus at the time, it was mom. Mom! Mom! And the whole while, my brother is, is, is yelling, I'm going to kill you! I'm going to kill you! And, and we're running back, and I'm screaming, Mom! Mom! And, and we get to the back of the yard, I fell down, I slipped on the grass, I fell down, he pounced on me. My mom was in the, I, I, I could see her face. She's at the sink and there was a window looking in the backyard and, 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 and I could just see her. <laughs> kind of shaking her head, just going, what? So she, kind of, she runs out and she pulls my brother off me and, uh, and, and, and she saved me in essence. And just, you know, we were the Christian family in, in our neighborhood. So uh, my brother and I were representing well, let me tell you, that day. She was so ashamed of us because uh, we had to run across several people's yards to get back to our yard and do all the while screaming bloody murder. So not a good look for Jesus that day. Here's the thing, friends. When, when we react, we always regret it. We always regret it because it makes Jesus look bad. It, make, it makes you feel good. I know it makes you feel good. I know when somebody cuts you off in traffic and you're like, mm, 
and you want to, uh, you want, you want so bad to give them, you know, you're number one, but not with this finger, you know, <laughs> double number ones. I, but friends, listen, you make Jesus look bad. When you react, you make Jesus look bad. When you react, you make Jesus look bad. When you react, you make him look bad. You lose your testimony when you react. That's why James says this. In James chapter 1, starting at verse 19, three verses, James says this. James is like the New Testament Solomon. He says, understand, my dear brothers and sisters, you must be quick to listen and slow to speak. And slow to get angry. Oh, Pastor, I'd stop right there because that's just not me. That's just not me. That's not my personality. No, that's not your personality. That's your flesh. Don't tell me that's your personality. Don't tell me that's how you grew up. Don't tell me, it, please, I understand. I grew up I, I, with, with people all around people that had hot tempers. But I'm here to tell you, friends, Jesus didn't have a hot temper. And you're a child of God. Your temper's got to go. If you want to represent Jesus well, you need to be slow to speak. Quick to listen and slow to get angry. He goes on to say, verse 20, if you don't believe me, just listen. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of, this is verse 21. He says, so get rid of all filth and evil in your lives. Did you catch that? He lumps anger with filth and evil. And then he says, humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. Oh, by the way, the reason we're, we usually get angry is because our pride has been tweaked. You don't want me to go here. I promise you don't want me. But pride is usually at the source. When we, get, when we have a hair trigger temper, when we're, and we believe or when people are offended or people are offending us, or there's, it's usually our pride that gets tweaked. So he says, humbly accept the word of the Lord. That God has planted in your heart so that it has the power to save your soul. So if that's a reaction, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to respond. A response is a measured, gracious reply that comes slowly and with thoughtful consideration of the effects your words or your actions are going to have. A gracious response usually comes after a deep breath, after we step back, and after we have time to think. I was not thinking on that day that I slugged my brother with the, with the log. I was just reacting. And the consequences of it were not just to me physically, as he pounded on me, but it was also, it made Jesus look bad. It was the end of World War II, and the city of Berlin was being split right down the middle, divided between the allies, okay? But one side representing the allies, the other side representing the communists, okay? And now the East Berliners in what would soon become communist Berlin, they decided that they were going to drive a dump truck over to the west side of Berlin, and, and that dump truck was filled with garbage. And so they, they, they took that dump truck filled with garbage and they dumped it on the streets of West Berlin. And then they drove away. So the people of East Berlin, okay, the, the people of West Berlin said, okay, two can play this game. They said, we're going to pick up all that garbage, we're going to put it back in a dump truck, we're going to take it back over to them, and we're going to dump it back on the east side. And they thought again about that. They stopped, and instead of reacted, reacting, they responded. And they, de they decided, maybe that's not the best way to handle this. So listen. Listen to what they did. Instead, they filled the dump truck. They filled it with canned food and non-perishable food items. And they drove their truck over to the east side of Berlin and they stacked all that food neatly in the street and they put a little sign beside it and this is what the sign read. 
Each gives what he has to give. Each gives what he has to give. It was true in Berlin back then, and it's true where you are today. There's no margin for error on this one, friends. Two wrongs never make a right. Come on, you need to turn to somebody and tell them that. Come on, if you're watching this on the live stream, just turn to somebody, even if your imaginary friend or so, you know, if they're in the other room drinking coffee or if they're in the bathroom, just say, hey, two wrongs never make a right. Come on, do it. Come on. Okay, it's evident. It's evident that in our culture today, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of bitterness in the hearts of people. Okay, and, and, and look, I... I don't doubt that we can be deeply offended when someone dumps their garbage on our core values. Those kind of offenses, though, can easily cause a root of bitterness and anger to spring up in our souls. Which is why the writer of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 12, verse 14, work at living in peace with everyone. Doesn't that sound familiar? Work at living with peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Here's verse 15. Now listen. Look after each other. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no bitter, poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you and to defile or corrupt many. That that when you have bitterness or you have you have that bitter anger in your soul that it grows and it bears poisonous fruit and that fruit defiles the people around you. It corrupts the people around you. It doesn't just ruin your testimony, it affects those around you. Because you can only give what you have. So it's too easy to point a finger. Listen, it's too easy to point a finger or, or dismiss others before you take an honest assessment of your own heart first. So would you be surprised if you did that? Would you be surprised if the Holy Spirit identified a similar root of bitterness and anger that, that's just hiding there, constricting your heart with unforgiveness? I like the way one author asked this. He said, do you rat pack your pain? Do you rat pack your pain? Do you amass offenses hanging on to them? Do you record every slight? A tour, a tour of your heart might be telling, he, he writes, a pile of rejections, accumulated insults, and no one can blame you because they're innocence, innocence takers, promise breakers, and, and wound makers. They're everywhere, and you've had your share. Everyone here has had their share, have been on the receiving end, in other words, of that kind of treatment. Friends, if that's true, if, the, if a bitter root is taken up, and, it, and, if it's, and if it's squeezing your heart, how do you uproot anger and bitterness? How do you keep it from happening again? Because offenses will continue to occur what if in, in what if because you're a christian what if persecution the fire that that persecution ramps up here in the united states we haven't we haven't even come close to it but what if it does friends how are you going to handle that are you going to want to take revenge are you going to let bitterness and anger wrap its roots around your heart how do you Okay, how do you cultivate and harvest peace? How do you cultivate and harvest peace? The answer lies in a simple, in a, it's a simple answer, but it's totally difficult. Here it is. We, if we're going to seek peace, friends, we must learn to forgive. Well, I'll forgive when he says he's sorry. All right, sweetie, we need to have a talk. No, I'll tell you what, let's not have a talk. Let's have you talk to Jesus at the altar 
and find out what Jesus says about that. I'd rather not be a part of that conversation. I'd just like to start it. Some of you are going, hey, Pastor, you are such a meddler today. I'm, I, why did I come to church? Why am I watching this on, my, on the relative ease of my sofa? Why, why can't I turn this, this live stream off right now? <laughs> Forgiveness is not optional for the forgiven. I'll say it again. Forgiveness is not optional for the forgiven. If you read the parable that where Jesus ramps up the bar, where he raises the bar on forgiveness to 400, you know, from 3 or 7 to 490, if you read the parable that follows that, it illustrates this very truth. It's in Matthew 18. Check it out later. Or, or what about when, when the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And he said this, after the prayer. Matthew 6, verse 14. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, then your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. Ramona had plenty of reasons not to forgive her father. She grew up in a Christian home. Or, 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 I'm sorry, she grew up with a Christian mother, but her father was an abusive alcoholic. As a young adult, R Ramona made a lot of terrible decisions. She married uh, several times. She descended, her life descended into drugs and alcohol abuse. And one night in the Pagoda Hotel in, in Hawaii, she saw a Gideon Bible. In the nightstand drawer next to the bed, she saw a Gideon Bible, and she took it home with her. She stole it and took that Bible home. Two years later, she found the Bible under a pile of stuff in her home. For two years, that Bible sat untouched. Once she had brought it home, untouched. She found it, and she decided to start reading it. This is what she said, I'm quoting. After reading a while, she said, I, it was like the words on the pages came to life and they opened my eyes and God cleansed me of all of my anger and unforgiveness and he set me free. Her life dramatically, her, 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 her life so dramatically changed in that in that moment that she forgave her father. She cared for him in, a, in his latter days and she led him to Christ before he died. That could not happen if Ramona had held on to unforgiveness. God's arms are always open. How many of you are glad for that? Always open to receive us. Always. Regardless of where we've been, regardless of what we've done, the promise <coughs> of his grace is like a beam of light that's so bright that, <coughs> that it can penetrate the deepest darkness. His grace and his mercy are like the, the promised breath of fresh air that's just above the choking smog of, un, of bitter unforgiveness. How blessed we are to breathe that in. How blessed we are to stand under the light of his glory and his grace. Amen? Amen? To receive it. And how blessed we are to share it with others. Not just to, say, to proclaim we're forgiven, but to forgive. Share grace, love well, seek peace. If you look again at the last part of Paul's instruction to, to Christians there living in that hostile culture, you'll see, this is in Romans chapter 12, verse 21. This is what it says. Don't let evil conquer you, but co conquer evil by doing good. By doing good. So de listen, despite cultural and political, acrimony, it's never a good time to burn bridges. I told this to someone on the phone the other day. It's at this stage in your life, I said to this person, no, nobody here at Calvary, 
But I said, at this stage in your life, this is not the time to burn bridges. As followers of Jesus, we build bridges. And we build them by sharing grace, by blessing others, by loving well, with, and living in harmony with one another, and by seeking peace, by refusing to react in revenge. All of this instruction is built, it's all predicated on forgiveness. God forgives us, and we forgive others. So as we've done throughout the series, we need, to, we, need, we need to start with God. We need to start with God. So whether you need God's forgiveness today, whether you need his forgiveness for sin, or you need to forgive someone that has sinned against you, will you pray with me right now? Come on, bow, let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Jesus, please forgive me. I need your grace and I need your mercy today. I need, I need shovel full, Lord God, buckets. I need, I need a truckload, Lord, uh, of, of your grace and your mercy today. I, God, I have held on to bitterness and unforgiveness, but I don't want to leave this moment with those roots wrapped around my heart. So I believe that you died, Jesus, on the cross for me. I believe that you took my sin on the cross and, and you bore it there and that you rose again victorious over sin, over death, and over hell. Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. And thank you. I, 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 I'm asking you, Father, to open my eyes at the end of this prayer. Without bitterness in my heart, Open my eyes, God. I thank you for the community that, that, that you brought me to here at Calvary. I thank you for this community. I thank you that, that this community of faith challenges me and encourages me. Thank you, Father, for making me part of your family. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to fill me today so that I can live new and different. Holy Spirit, I know how much the enemy doesn't want me to get this truth. Please empower me. Holy Spirit, empower me to, to not just be a recipient of grace, but to share grace with others. To be lavish and generous as you've been with me. Help me to love well. Help me to live in harmony with, with, with the family of God here at Calvary. And Holy Spirit, help me not to react, but to learn to respond as you give me the words to speak or as you hold my tongue to keep me from saying what I should not. Help me, Holy Spirit, to be more like Jesus. Come on, will you say that part with me? Come on, say it out loud. Holy Spirit, help me to be more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. So if you prayed this prayer, uh, and, and, again, as we'll continue to do, I, I want to remind you, you're forgiven. That's your moment to say, thank God. That's your moment to say, praise the Lord. That's your moment to celebrate. You're forgiven. I want to encourage you, though, uh, it, 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 to continue to grow. If you're watching us uh, online today, I want to encourage you to grow in your new faith. If you put your faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross, then, and, and you're trusting God for what's next, I encourage you also to go to journeyonline.org for help with tough life issues, for answers to questions about the Bible and about faith, and also, also to go there and you're going to hear testimonies of people and teaching from people that have been where you are. And those things, I believe, those resources will help you in your new life with Jesus. We don't fight our battles alone. Okay? You don't have to walk through this process alone. You don't have to do it alone. I, I want to encourage you. Uh, listen, if you're watching on, online, uh, I want to encourage you. It's home, folks, here today. Find a church home because together is so much better. We are better together. The church is an essential part of the abundant life that Jesus promised. 
that Jesus promised his followers. Remember, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus says, but I have come to give you life. Come on, he might try to do that, but I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. And friends, the church is a part of that. So find a place where you can be loved and find a place where you can love. That's what he wants to do. And I I just want you to know you're always welcome here at Calvary. You are always welcome here. If you'd like more information about who we are, check us out at calvaryconnects.com. We may not be on the same side politically, Okay, our perspectives could be wildly different on a host of issues. But we have this in common. Truth. We believe Jesus is the sole answer to humanity's problem. And humanity's problem is sin. Okay, the problem is sin. But Jesus came to take care of that once and for all. Amen? That's part of our bond together. Okay? So I want you to tell people about God's good plan. Tell people about God's good plan. Share your story. Share your story. And tell them about the hope that you have in Jesus. Oh, and please, this week, be a conduit of grace. Show them grace. Okay? And let them see the joy that you have because you're a follower of Jesus. Come on. Tell and show. Tell and show. Let it start with the people closest to you and your family that may not be believers, co-workers, friends, neighbors, and strangers that he puts in your life. Come on. Tell and show. We're better together. Amen?